Welcome to this late night rant on Darwinian delusions. So what I want to speak about is the no true Scotsman fallacy. This is a very fun fallacy. What it basically is is this. You have a universal generalization. No true Scotsman puts sugar in their oats. So you claim. And then somebody points out yeah, that may be true with a few people, but hang on. Here's Tom. Tom's a Scotsman. He's wearing a kilt. And he puts sugar in his oats. So your idea that no true Scotsman puts sugar in his oats is defeated. You have a defeater for that idea. But then the person replies, no, Tom isn't a real Scotsman. That's the no true Scotsman fallacy, an informal fallacy. Why this is a fallacy is because what you're doing is that in an ad hoc fashion, you're changing the goalposts. You're changing the definition of what it means to be a true Scotsman. Who happens to be using this fallacy? Well, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out. It's actually Darwinist. On this channel, all I do is I quote when I'm speaking about biological evolution and the challenges to it and whatnot. Atheist, agnostic, philosophers of science and evolutionary biologists. I don't use people who believe in God. If I did use people in, who believe in God, then this is what the Darwinists would say. They would say, no, those aren't real biologists because they believe in God, right? Those aren't real scientists. Even when someone like Jerry Fodor, uh, when he, clearly being a naturalist and atheist, when he challenged Darwinism, what was he called? He was called a secular creationist. So these guys, they actually use this informal fallacy. However, what if I was to do the opposite? What if I was to say, right, I'm not going to take any of these Darwinist atheists seriously. I'm not going to take any of them seriously. I'm only going to use biologists who believe in God and philosophers of biology who believe in God. I'm not going to use anyone who's an atheist. These atheists would be livid. They would freak out. They'd be like, what are you doing? That's an informal fallacy. X, Y, Z, right? But when they're using this fallacy, it's not a problem. So they're very good at pointing out fallacies when someone else is using them. So, where are we at? Well, we're at a position which is an asymmetrical relationship. An asymmetrical, sorry, tactic. So, I'm catering to them because these people, they complain, Oh, we don't want to believe in God. We're not going to take anybody who believes in God seriously. And they're not really a biologist. They're not really an academic. So, you know... I'm allowing them because they have this fallacy and I just let them have it and I carry on. But I could do it the other way around. However, there is a limitation to what I'm doing and it is problematic. And that reason is this. You see, if someone starts off, and this is, again, I have to be very careful with my words because a lot of people get confused. Darwinism in of itself is not atheistic. However, if you start off with atheism, something like Darwinism has to be true by necessity, a priori. Why? Because if there is no God, then you have to go and give a naturalistic explanation. The best naturalistic explanation would be something like Darwinism, right? So we are at a glass ceiling with the sort of approach of only quoting evolutionary biologists and philosophers who believe in God. Because if you happen to be an atheist, you're automatically going to be somebody who believes in some sort of proto-Darwinian explanation for the history of life on earth. That's just going to be a logical necessity from your worldview. So using atheist philosophers and atheist biologists, we're automatically limited to the conceptual tools that we actually have. And this is why when it comes to, especially to common ancestry, I'm thinking increasingly about breaking my rule of only using atheist biologists and atheist philosophers of, of biology and actually going to ones who believe in God. Because the atheist ones... Whether they believe in the neo-Darwinian mechanism or not, they're going to be biased. They just are because they happen to be atheists. And if you're atheist, then something like universal common ancestry makes a lot more sense. If you're theistic, it, it you can still believe in universal common ancestry and you cannot believe in it. But if you're an atheist, that's, you know, using Occam's razor, pretty much the only conclusion you can come up with. So that's why I'm thinking about breaking my rule of only using 
atheist biologists and atheist philosophers of science. Why should we cater to their pathetic, no true Scotsman's fallacy? What we should do is basically tell them, no, we're not going to put up with that. We're actually going to challenge your paradigm and we're going to use people who believe in God. And if you want to challenge our paradigm, then what you should do is use people who believe in God. Because that's the only evidence we're going to accept. Isn't that failure? That's what you guys do with us. You're like, we're not going to take anyone seriously unless they're, in, unless they're an atheist. Well, I could just turn around and say to you, I'm not going to take anyone seriously unless they believe in God. I'm not going to take any biologist, philosopher, or science seriously unless they believe in God. Now, of course, we're not really going to get anywhere with that sort of tit for tat. However, this is just some food for thought to help you guys evolve in your thinking, evolve in a progressive, non-Darwinian way. Anyway, let me know your thoughts about this late night rant. And... Um, yeah, look forward to hearing your uh, listening, uh, reading your comments.